Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby back, back again. It's been a minute, admittedly been a minute, but back again here. With a new weekly show. I'm running Big Game James. This is Positively Relentless, the debut of Positively Relentless. We're going to be talking Mavs, Cowboys, mixing it up every week. I don't know if these episodes will always go out Wednesday night. Be recorded Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Whatever. You, you'll be happy with it. James, how are you doing? Man, I'm chilling, dog. You know, like I said, we ready to do this. We've been talking about this forever. Ready to finally get it in. Talk Mavericks, fo- uh, Mavericks football. Uh, I'm, I said Mavericks football. Mavericks basketball. Dallas Cowboys football. Um, you know, just ready to talk about it. You know, the draft is going to be coming up um, tomorrow. Um, and then eventually there'll be the draft for the NBA. So it's always going to be something to talk about in the sports arena, especially with these Cowboys and Mavericks. So um, hopefully the Mavs can uh, do their thing and uh, get advanced because uh, it's been a long time since they've been advanced that first round, man. Yeah, it really has. They haven't been past the first round since they won the championship in 2011. Mm-hmm. So it's been it's been a bit of a drought, mm-hmm. you might say. It's a, bit, it's a dry spell. Yeah, on, bo- but, uh, on, the good on news- both sides. Football and yes. basketball. Yeah, it's it's been a hard decade, two decades, two and a half decades for Cowboy fans. But uh, yeah, thankfully, and you got to knock on wood saying this, but the Mavericks are up 3-2. They were up 3-2 last year. It was the first time they had ever blown a 3-2 lead in a series. So that was bad last year. We'll get into that sort of a little bit. But let's real quick just run through uh, some of the Game 5 stuff here. Obviously, it's old news. We're not going to linger on it too much. But the Mavericks won an absolute laugher, 102 to 77. The Jazz basically came out with a big bag of nothing. And I don't know how often you see a team that's like invested a lot of money in big names and is just this dysfunctional. Like the Jazz have an obscene amount of money tied up in Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. And this team doesn't look good like they they came out well in game four but dallas really let that one get away they had a four point lead with 39 seconds left and you still had a controversial call that allowed the comeback to happen so this series could have ended in five with luca missing the first what three games right absurd absurd (laughs) and yet that's kind of the state of it so like you give all the credit in the world to the mavericks obviously their defense has been great Jalen Brunson is having a coming out party and earning himself loads and loads of money. Oh, he's about to but, get paid. Uh, oh, so paid. And yet you have like Donovan Mitchell going four of 15 in game five for nine points, a minus 38 in the game. Like the dude had a, a bag of nothing. If Luca ever did that in a playoff game, he would be eviscerated. Yeah. And, and now I know he left with hamstring tightness said he needed help back to the locker room, in fact. But he's already since then said, like, oh, it's just a bruise. I'm going to play this next No, game. that was just him saying, you know what? I'm Saving done. Face. I don't want to I'm. I don't want to do this no more. I'm going to go ahead and take this little injury, say I'm hurt a little bit in, in this game, and then I'll be good for the next game. He wasn't injured. Mm-hmm. I'm not believing that. I'm not believing he had a messed up hamstring. Oh, but it, uh, but it was a hamstring. That was a bruise. No, your ego was bruised. You you played bad. Everybody was going to rip you. So the easiest way for you to, to not really have to deal with it is the injury, man. Tell me players do it, so I don't want to hear that, Donovan. But, hey, keep on messing up. Your messing up is Mavericks game. So please continue to mess up. Oh, 100%. So the crazy thing is the Mavericks won this game by 25. They didn't even shoot the ball well nope, at all. Nope. Like they shot 27% from three. And they was making me and mad with that too, DDP. Sorry about that. But that was making me mad because I'm like, y'all falling into the jazz game. I mean, the jazz, um, you know, jazz will just shoot threes all day going game. I think they were, was like three for 30 or something like that in that game. And I mean, yeah, they were, that's, that, that was terrible. So really, I mean, let's keep it real. You don't see teams just miss like that every game. So, you know, hopefully that continues, but you don't really see teams just missing threes like that because they had a lot of open looks. They had a lot of looks mm-hmm. where if they were making those, you're like, ooh, they could really just 
come back real quick or they could really open up a lead uh, because they had open looks, but they were just missing them. Um, but the Mavericks were falling into it where they were coming right back down the court and hike, hiking up a three. And I'm like, no, man, take that to the hole. I did like when Jason Kidd told that timeout. I think they were up like 20. He called a timeout and uh, they started going to the hole. And that's what I like he did because I was screaming at the TV to do the same dang old thing. Oh, absolutely. So the Jazz, they hoist, I think, their second in the league in terms of attempts or their first in attempts, second in makes per game, something like that. And Dallas's strategy has been to basically body them up and force them to put the ball on the ground, basically daring them to take it into the teeth of the defense because that's not their game. And so Utah's three-point attempts per game is actually comfortably down in this series compared to the regular season. Now, you mentioned that three of 30 number. How bad is that? It is the single worst playoff shooting game in NBA history Mm. as far as percentage. Mm. Three of 30. Dallas shot 27% from three. Even if they'd only made half as many of those, they would have, they still would have won this game comfortably. And that's why I said, like Dallas, if they even shot the ball well, they're winning this game by 40. Right. 45. Like this game was nothing. Utah had nothing to offer. And Luca, man, in the third quarter, he put it on his back. He went 19 points in the third quarter and they just ran away with it. And like, that's what you want. Like you got Luca back in there, like, okay, bury him. Don't hang around. Mm -hmm. Got your foot on their throat, press down until they stop moving. Just end the game. And that's what they did. Now, It'll be interesting to see how they respond now, having to go back to probably one of the more, if not the most hostile uh, road environments in the league. It'll be interesting to see if Dallas can close this out because Utah doesn't look like they want to be there right now. Like they came out and they played really hard in game four, but you just saw none of that fight in game five. It looked like all of the, everything they expelled in game four, it's like in the back of their mind, even they know they got away with a win. And it's like they kind of think like, man, we couldn't even really beat them consistently without Luca. Now he's back and he's averaging 35 a game still in the last two games. What shot do we have? Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. I, I mean, it'll I mean, I'm I didn't mean to uh cut you off, but I, no, I, I think it's like, well, I'm not gonna go by, you know, Dallas blew him out. I said on, on my mm-hmm. Twitter on my tweet that whoever wins that game five is going to win the series. I still believe that. So I feel like the Dallas Mavericks are going to win this series, but I think this game is this next game is going to be tremendously tough because of just what you said. I've seen uh, jazz since Carl Malone and John Stockton, you know what I'm saying? And Jeff Horn is second and uh, you know, uh, Blue Edwards, you know, Ty Corbin. I, I've, I've seen them guys since then. And that crowd always been like that. And that crowd will win games for you. I've seen when Utah was like, shouldn't won games, but they, you play them in Utah, Utah pull games out in Utah because that crowd is so crazy uh, there. So I definitely feel like that crowd is going to keep them in it. So I feel like the very, let's say maybe the first quarter, like the first maybe six, seven minutes of the game, that's what I'm really going to look at to see how the Jazz come out. If the Mavericks come out and we're doing what we were doing this past game five, I'm feeling really good that, okay, yeah, they 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 kind of conceded. But if it's one of those games where they're coming and hitting them threes, being real, real aggressive, um, it's going to be a, one of those dog fights. And the Mavericks is going to have to play really smart, tough uh, basketball all the way through because it's going to be one of those games. And I hope it's not one of those games where, you know, they shoot themselves out of it. You know what I mean? Take good shots don't, because it's going to be that type of environment. Those shots got to count uh, when you're in Utah. Oh, 100%. And it's interesting, too, which kind of pivots into the next topic here, and that is kind of looking at how this Mavericks team differs from last year's team that went up 2-0 in that series and then took a 3-2 lead, beating the Clippers in L.A. Uh, So they beat them three times in L.A., but they could never win at home. Then Game 7 had to go back to L.A., and finally the home, home team got a win there. So... You mentioned how pivotal game five is. If you look at just the math of playoff history teams that win game five when the series is tied 2-2, they win something like 83% of the time. Dallas was in that rare territory. It was also their first time blowing a series up Um, 3-2. There there was a lot of interesting kind of history that came from last year. So how does this team differ? How does this situation differ? And what I've been looking at 
I, I looked back at that series last year and what really stood out to me was in those first two games Dallas took in LA, it was the role players, particularly Dorian Finney Smith shooting absolute lights out. How did this series start? You had, especially games two and three, more so Maxi Kleba, but you had role players shooting the lights out. Now, last year, it wore on, and as the series dragged on, that shooting significantly cooled. What has Maxi Kleba done the last two games after scorching like 14 out of 17 threes over the course of two games? What's he done since then? He's been, I think, scoreless and like four points. He's done nothing. Uh, He's played good defense. I'm not trying to take that away, Mm -hmm. but there are some parallels. And that's why I wanted to look at this to kind of understand like, okay, is this a temporary like storm Utah just has to kind of weather, or is this an actual sign of, or is that more coincidence? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the difference here is simply put, Kawhi Leonard is not on the Jazz. That's kind of what it boils down to. Kawhi Leonard was an absolute Terminator assassin in that series last year. I mean, especially when he kicked it into high gear when they were on the absolute ropes, Dallas had like a 20-point lead in the third quarter of game three. And or maybe it was the second quarter. But the point is, like, Kawhi basically put the team on his back, shot like 64% in the field, 60% from three, and dragged them back into that series. And that, you know, between that and Dallas's role players going cold, shooting the ball, basically kind of even the playing field where Dallas was regressed to the mean. And you saw like, oh, okay, the Clippers are a better team, if for no other reason than Kawhi Leonard. But their role players are more more balanced, or rather they were at the time. So, yeah, because Dallas in those stretches, they shot 33% um, the last few games of the series. The first two games, Dallas shot 52.8% from three, and they made 37 threes in those first three games. So 52.8% through the first three games made 37 threes. The rest of the way, 33%. And if you take out the 51% of game three, it shot 28.9%. So once the three-point shot betrayed Dallas last year, live by the three, die by the three kind of happened. And this year, it's a different story because you have – really good mid-range game here like Jalen Brunson is cooking in that mid-range he has so much craftiness and great footwork and really aside from game four he's been dialed in like he missed a lot of shots in game four that he didn't miss the rest of the series and that's really been something that Utah can't contend with also Utah's not nearly the defensive team that the Clippers were Gobert is a freak defensively but he is all they've got Donovan Mitchell, I knew he wasn't a good defender coming into the series. I had no idea how bad right. he is. Yeah. Like, it's not even just Luka attacking him. It's anybody he's guarding is taking him off the dribble and getting what they want. Well, I mean, if you look at it, like you said, I think it's more so the reason why Dallas is better is because they're not living by this three. Uh, they do have a, a playmaker in Jalen Brunson. I think that really helps uh, because uh, Luka is very ball dominant. And it was usually, to me, uh, the last couple of years, Luka, 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 and then trying to find him finding somebody at the end of the, you know, the shot clock uh, because they didn't have really anybody else could create off the ball. You know, they just had a spot up shooters. You know what I mean? It was Luka going to the hole and kicking out to them or going, him going to the hole and, you know, scoring. But like you said, when Brunson is now, uh, because me and you were talking when we were sending that text, how uh, Rick Carlisle kind of kept Brunson under wraps. And we knew he could really run 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 that game, uh, but Carlisle never let him do it. Uh, but you see a Jason Kidd who is a point guard, and who knows those type of things, and he's letting him do it, letting him cook. Um, and that's what I, I think that's the biggest reason. I mean, uh, Luca's averaging like 33 in these playoffs. Um, Brunson is averaging, well, he's averaging 31. Brunson's yeah. averaging 28.6. You feel me? Yeah. And like you said, he's going to the hole and he's creating besides Luca, and that's putting the pressure on the Jazz. And you still got, we were talking about, and we're going to talk about him, Spencer. Uh, Denwitty, but yep. he still is able to create off the ball as well. He can bring up the ball, um, you know, when that you know, taking the ball out, he can bring the ball up the court. He's a versatile player, and I think mm-hmm. that's what the Mavericks were missing. Uh, before they got guys, multiple guys that can take it to the hole and create, and then they can still have their sp- few spot up shooters, 
We're still talking about how they need that defensive presence as far as the big man. Um, but I'll commend the White Powell from coming back from that Achilles. He looks a lot better than he did last year. I mean, he looks like a more healthier. Uh, but man, I just feel like, you know, in the end, DDP, uh, they still need that big man um, to solidify what they're trying to do um, later on. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the defense has been tremendous here. Like Donovan Mitchell, he's averaging 26 points per game in the series. But you look at that and you're like, oh, that's pretty strong, right? Well, he's shooting 37.9% from the field and a putrid 19.5% from three. He is not scoring well. Like I said, Dallas is basically forcing him off the three-point line a lot. He's taking a lot of difficult forcing shots. Uh, it's just not going for him. Like he hasn't really gotten comfortable and he's credited after pretty much every single game, the job that Dorian Finney-Smith has done. Dodo, he's not going to get all defensive team honors, it sounds like, but he really deserves it. Like he has had a phenomenal defensive year. And you mentioned Dwight Powell. He's been, yeah, sensational this year. He's been probably the single biggest punching bag in like Mavericks fandom as far as the past several years. And I think part of that, you know, I don't know how many people still have in the back of their mind, the understanding that he was part of the Rondo trade and like that blew up so badly. It's almost like a, an unconscious bias a little bit. He definitely had his struggles, but now that he's a full year removed from the injury, you see much more what he is. And I think Dallas is kind of utilizing him better when they're having him play defense. They're not, you know, drop coverage in the pick and roll. And that's, working to his strength, like what they were doing defensively before was putting him in a terrible situation for him repeatedly every single game. And so it kind of exposed his weaknesses and it just made everything look all the worse. They're doing a better job with this. Like Jason Kidd deserves a lot of credit. So does the entire coaching staff. He put a really good coaching staff together and the way that they're attacking Utah is a masterclass because Utah was a juggernaut offensively. And they've only broken the century mark, like what, once in this series? And that was like a 109, 104. Like Dallas is tightening the screws defensively and Utah doesn't have any answers. The, the most ambitious thing Utah tried to do to counter that with Dallas was pick up Luka and Jalen Brunson full court with pressure. And you know what the trade-off was there? Bogdanovich, who murdered Dallas the first three games, went from averaging like 27 points a game to like nine. He is worn out chasing these guys full court and dealing with them and his efficiency has plummeted now like that's the trade-off teams might want to come in here and be like oh okay we're going to play hard on defense and we're going to scramble like the mavericks do well the mavericks have done it all year they've geared themselves for this utah they're not used to having to like really as a team scramble and work like this they kind of are spoiled by rudy gobert masking so much of their issues and now that it's getting exposed they don't have, it seems like, the, the fortitude to really dig in and do that possession after possession, game after game. And that's all the benefit of Dallas. Yeah, man. And plus, you know, when, when I look at, uh, you know, Donovan Mitchell, he's not really a three-point shooter to me anyway. He was never like a great three-point shooter to me. Um, I, I don't know what his career percentage is, but, um, you know, the guy that really is going to – is really besides him that – uh, can really do anything is Jordan Clarkston. Um, now I'm gonna tell you right now, Jordan Clarkston, he gets to the hole. Um, I mean, he he he's a type of player that he he's gonna put some pressure on you. So Jordan Clarkston is the one kid that he still I keep my eye on him uh, because he gets hot, man. You know what I'm saying, DDP? Uh, Jordan Clarkston, mm -hmm. he's a problem, man. Like he can shoot. And he's a very aggressive going to the hole. He makes these hard, very difficult degree shots. Um, he's very confident how he plays. So I think the way Donovan Mitchell may be struggling, the Mavs definitely need to continue to keep an eye on Clarkson uh, because he's, what, their third leading scorer um, on the team. And even when they were losing that game, he was the one that was still presenting a problem getting to the hole and scoring points. Yeah, no, he, you're right. He has been – their best option the past two games. And it's been on past two games where he's kind of stepped up in, in the absence of Bogdanovich's production. Um, and that's, it's both necessary and fortuitous for Utah because without him, one, they don't win game four because in the final quarter, especially mm -hmm. of game four, he was all they had. Yep. 
he was the only thing going for them offensively. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, the reason they're not already at home is because he balled out and he was great again in game five. It's just, he's not getting any help. Right. And yeah, so they're, they're probably gonna have to lean on him. I don't know what adjustments Utah really has at this point. And I don't know, looking at the body language of these guys, I don't know how much that they're really even trying to find those answers. It kind of looks like a team ready to run out the string at this point. I mean, you should have to see. It could be a deceiving thing, but everything you saw in the body language from the team looked like they had largely quit, like they were ready for the season to kind of be done. And it's not just the season. They're going to have to completely blow up this roster. Like they'll hang on to Mitchell, but I think Gobert is going to probably be moved. Oh, he's definitely going to be moved. And I'm curious, too, what that's going to look like because this series has kind of shown, like the NBA evolved so like so fast. And the way its trajectory has looked, you went from like entering this seat, uh, this series saying like, oh, dude, imagine if somehow Dallas could get Gobert in the offseason. Now, Perfect now, you're, by now you're looking now, he might. now you're like, eh, I don't know, because that big ball, yeah. that big man is getting exposed, like left and the right. His I mean, that the small ball works. I mean, I still feel like you got to have that guy that's about that 6'10", 6'11", mm-hmm. but you don't have to have that seven-footer, that, that traditional. Like $40 yeah, you don't have to do that anymore uh, because right. you can get that 6'10", 6'11", 6'8". You can get those guys that are athletic enough where you don't have to force yourself to get that and pay that any longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, just like you were saying, you looked at it from afar like, ooh, Gobert be an uh, asset. But then now when you look at it, you're like, eh, you don't really need him. Uh, I like more of an athletic type of guy. We were talking about, um, you know, Miles Turner. I want somebody with that type that's a big man but versatile and doesn't have to be pigeonholed as center, 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 and that's just what it is. You know what I mean? Versatile guys are what is kind of at in the NBA in 2022 and beyond. So it, it's interesting to look at because you, you definitely weigh what you think Gobert is. Like what he brings defensively? undeniable and his versatility is great but he doesn't have any kind of real offensive game certainly nothing outside and for what he's commanding salary wise Mm -hmm. you can't pay a dude like i understand there's not many teams that can go five out truly like the reason dallas was playing him off the court in the first two games is because maxi was hitting everything and so you had that option but you don't want to pay a guy 40 million dollars who can be played off the court by the handful of teams who are capable of doing that, which by the way, are going to be your top tier teams. You don't want to pay $40 million to a guy knowing, well, Hey, this will help us beat 80% of the league, but it's not going to help us when we play the big boys. Right. You know what I mean? Especially in the playoffs. No unintended. Yeah. So it, it's, you don't want to look at it that way for Dallas though. Their small ball lineup is working. I do feel like that's going to eventually bite them, the lack of front court Mm -hmm. depth, particularly rebounding. They've had to play a maddening chess match here where if like they're conceding a lot of points in the paint, they're conceding uh, rebounding, and they're kind of getting away with it. Like those two things go very much counter the second chance points, obviously, go very much counter to traditional logic of how to win a game. Um, other, other than that, you would just cite like turnovers, right? Mm-hmm. And yet they're getting away with it because they're basically saying, Hey man, we're going to shoot the lights out for the most part. And three is always going to beat two. And we're going to give you a contested shot at the rim. And it doesn't matter how many crazy dunks or alley-oops you throw down. We're going to say like, all right, that's cool. Now I'm going to go splash a three, another corner three for you. Another corner three for you. Mm-hmm. When the sequence in game five where Luca in the third quarter blocks a three-point attempt and then shoots like a 40-foot three in a guy's eye was the and I say this in the in the best way possible, the grossest thing I've ever seen. It was so ridiculous and the full arrogance and swagger uh on effect. Like every every superstar has that mode where it's just mean mugging and just like bro, get out of my way. Like you have don't even try to guard this. You're not going to get it. Like that 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 vibe feels like it's very much throughout this entire roster. Whereas before it was kind of Luca and company. Now it's like, no, it's Luca and the dudes. Like it's Luca and his guys. Like look at a uh, white side, taking the shot at Luca in the game. What happened? The entire, you know, entire team got up and got there. Reggie Bullock actually looked like the dog. They told us James uh, Johnson and uh, what was the other guy? 
Josh you know, Boston. Wow, I'm blanking on a name. Was it the guard? Riddick. Yeah. I can't remember He's, his name. I, I know who you're talking yeah. about too. Um, yeah, but they didn't. That's but basically, hilarious. they didn't do it. They they didn't force it. You got no. more guys. I don't know. It just seems like a night and day team from last year or even the year before. Um, you know, once the honestly, it just seemed like once the movement of KP, once he was gone, mm-hmm. it just seemed like the team came together. Um, started playing more. It just seemed like they were more together. Um, more team oriented. More moving. More ball movement. Um, just more spacing. Just seemed like things just happened right. better. Uh, once the KP removal happened, no, no diss to KP. It just seemed like that it just wasn't fundamentally going to work and you just had to move on. So it was good that it had to happen that good. It happened that way. And like you said, the, the, the supporting cast to me is just a lot better. I just feel like it's a lot more confident. It's a lot more togetherness. Um, and I feel like, you know, we needed some new blood with a new coach. You know, I had said it last year, wasn't trying to diss Rick Carlisle and say he was a bad coach. But once you've been there, like I talked about with Jason Garrett um, with the Dallas Cowboys, once you've been in an organization for so long, you had that championship a long time ago. Now it's like, what have you done lately? We can't keep on remembering what you did in 2011. You know what I'm saying? Can't keep talking about that one championship every single time to keep you holding on. And I just felt like it got stale in Dallas. It wasn't that excitement like that in Dallas. And I feel like getting Jason Kidd, he brought excitement. Um, you know, I, I, you know, kid, I always loved Jason Kidd. I don't understand why people were hating on him, you know, when he was a coach, because I, I thought he was a pretty good coach then. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but I, I feel like kid's a good coach. And um, I, I'm glad the Cal, uh, I'm glad the Mavs brought him on board. And I feel like it's going to get better because I think he has a good mind as far as where, we, where you want to go in a draft and things of that nature. And I think that because he's the coach, I think he can bring maybe, you know, people are like, oh, well, look at there. Maybe you don't people don't want to come there. But I feel like Jason Kidd being there, that helps bring other free agents to the to the um, Mavericks in a very new, near future. He's definitely highly respected, especially now. Like he's always had defensive turnarounds for his teams. Yeah. It fizzled out with uh, with Brooklyn and with Milwaukee. And they were kind of culture concerns but it seems like he grew a lot in LA and he still brought that incredible defensive turnaround to Dallas actually his best job yet in terms of a defensive turnaround from one season to the next um in his first year at one of these stops and yeah he's highly respected so is even an assistant on his staff Jared Dudley uh your GM Nico Harrison is highly respected so yeah maybe it will be different moving forward but Let's, I always say this, let's just start with getting out of the first round. Like people are already trying to talk about like, oh, well, hey, Booker's roughed up for Phoenix. You could have a matchup. I'm like, stop, stop. Right. Let's get out of this round. Yeah, let's don't do that. Series. Don't do not do that. Don't do that because that's when yeah. you're going to get smacked up. Let's continue this exactly. one game at a time, folks. One game at a time because this game six is going to be crazy. Yep. And let's uh, let's talk now about something that is still a bit of a concern, at least for me. That is, we mentioned him earlier, Spencer Dinwiddie. Very much feast or famine. We know in the 23 games he played for the Mavericks after the Dinwiddie-Porzingis trade, uh, he was stellar. Like, it took him a couple games to really get going, but then he was absurd. 15.7 points per game on 49.8% shooting from the field and 40.4% from three. That was him in 23 games with the Mavericks in the regular season. We knew that that was probably not going to continue at that clip, but we're seeing definitely a bit of a regression here. This is, this is a, so you look at it, 14.6 points per game. This is average in this series, 32.4% shooting, however, and a measly 22.2% from three. Now in the regular season, in 23 games, he had 31 turnovers. Do you want to guess how many turnovers he has in five games here? Let's say over or under 10. Uh, he has over a 10. He has 12 turnovers in five games. Mm-hmm. So his turnovers are up, despite that being one of his best facets. And again, he's the third ball handler in Dallas. He's a you like having multiple guys that can run the offense and handle the ball. But with his shot struggling, he's pressing in this. You see he is pressing, 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 trying to get something going. He's forcing he can get penetration into the lane and that's great 
but he's, you can tell he's really searching for something. And I don't know how much it's white side and go bear uh, again, formidable defensive front court for sure. I don't know how much it's them just altering his shots around the basket and giving him issues. That's then, you know, guys will get going a little bit. They'll try and get a couple easy buckets close by the basket and then they'll kind of find that rhythm and expand out. And suddenly they're able to knock down threes a little better. It's like, he's not able to get that part of his game going. He did have in game three, a dagger that he hit where I think he pushed the lead back to like eight or something with like a minute 12 or something. And uh, it was a huge shot and it was like his only made three on the day, but he has not been good in this series without Luca. He had, let me see here. There's, there's more to this trend as well. So he had, since Luca came back, he has scored five and nine points on a combined five of 18 shooting. When he was a starter in the series, he scored 22, 17, and 20, albeit on inefficient shooting, that being 18 of 54 through the first three games, 33%, uh, and three of 17 from three, 17.6%. Last two games, he has three of 10 from three. So, yeah, he's not like it's you're very fortunate you haven't had to rely on him too much yet, which is why I didn't love the shot that they got at the end of game four, the, the attempted buzzer beater, not only because they had 11 seconds left and just brought the ball up very willy nilly and didn't even really make a move uh, with Luca until there were like five seconds left, just not near enough time to execute something. I know that play worked in Brooklyn. I know it worked against Boston to feed Dinwiddie for those looks. This is different and Dinwiddie's not cooking to force that shot at the buzzer. He catches the ball with 1.2 seconds left. If you get him the ball faster, he swings the ball to the corner and Dorian Finney-Smith has a wide open three-point look. But because he gets it at 1.2 seconds, he has no choice but to shoot it as Gobert is flying 100 miles an hour at him. So misses it pretty badly. And that's, that's the game. Like Again, when he's cooking, maybe it's a different story, but I didn't love going to him in that moment. You're fortunate he hasn't, been a bigger problem for you that you're not needing him more right now in this series. But I think Dallas's ceiling and how far they can go is entirely dependent on him. Like Luca can cook, Brunson can cook, but if he doesn't get something going, they're going to eventually uh, run into enough resistance. And with him not, with him coming off the bench now, they have to have that bench scoring since he, you know, since he's kind of fizzled, the bench scoring has dropped off a cliff and that, also limits how far Dallas can go. And he's the engine of that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, you know, you need his offense. Um, he, like you said, he's like the third guy. Um, he, and he, he can create from a point guard position, a shooting guard position, can play multiple positions for you. Uh, but here's the thing, though. I think I'm going to go ahead and say, then when he gets up out of his streak, his uh, slump uh, game six, I know he has been pressing. You can tell he's been pressing. I think it has a little bit to do with the size. You know, I, I, I play the game, and, and when you miss a few shots, then those shots that you usually make and they come in and out the rim or, you, you know, you usually make those, it starts getting frustrating, and then you want to kind of just get off the snide. So then you usually take those shots that you probably normally wouldn't take uh, just because you're just trying to get it in that bucket because you just feel like in your head, if I can just get that one in there, I'm kind of good. So um, I, I personally – I'm not saying shoot out the team, but continue to be aggressive. Then with I'm I'm cool. Be, continue to be aggressive. Don't get gun shy because you're in a little bit of a slump. You're missing, you know, some shots because they need you. They're gonna need they're gonna need Dan Whitty in game six. So I don't want him coming out gun shy because he's been in a little slump. I still want him coming out being aggressive. They got to figure it out. Um, you know, well, with him, you know, with Luca coming back, I don't know if that maybe affected his game a little bit, threw it off a little bit, you know, because they're incorporating Luca back in, you know, the lineup because, I mean, it was Brunson. Brunson was the guy uh, when Luca was going. So I haven't had to see him adjust a little bit through these last couple games because Luca is ball dominant and, you know, where Brunson was ho- handling it. So sometimes it's a weird dynamic when I watch those two uh, because, it, it, Luca uh, taking the ball all the way down the the shot clock all the way down and then try to kick it out to you and then you got to create a shot at the last second. I don't like when he does that at times. You know what I'm saying? Because it puts the person, the player, in a bad position. So I think they're still trying to figure that out in the playoffs. Maybe we'll you know you know more acclimation, more playing together. Uh, maybe that'll get the kinks out. But I still want Dinwiddie to still be aggressive in this game, especially Game Six. 
Sure. And also worth calling out before we wrap up this segment, uh, Dinwiddie in those 23 games was only averaging about 25 minutes a game. And when Luca was out to start the series, obviously he was back in the starting lineup and he was playing like 40 to 43 minutes a game, way more. And I think that exposed him a little bit. And so it's possible you kind of get a little bit. And that's why it's important to close out the series now and buy yourself as much possible rest as you can. Because I really do think, again, not visiting myself looking at other series or anything, but it is looking more and more like that first round series for Phoenix and uh, the Pelicans might go seven. And so if you can steal a couple extra days of rest, do it, especially for a guy that's coming a year off of an ACL. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's huge. And that might be pivotal for him getting his uh, rhythm back and everything, just having that time to rest and to, to practice a little bit, but they need them for sure. So now we're going to pivot from the Mavericks. They play Thursday night in Utah, chance to close out the series. Uh -huh. and we'll see how that goes, and we'll follow up on that. Uh -huh. But uh, we're going to pivot to the Dallas Cowboys. Right. We got some draft needs here. It has been a very, shall we say, tumultuous few months. <laughs> It's uh, I'm still honestly reeling a little bit from the playoff game. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm still it's kind of like a, a Rocky movie. I just got hit by Drago in the face and I haven't quite rearranged my face and stood back up yet. That's how it feels. Tell me. Uh, tell me what you're looking at here with the Cowboys. Well, you know, I just I'm, I've been on the radar, you know, just trying to uh, keep my eye on, you know, what's the ear and what they've been talking about. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, they. Uh, you know, I said that 14 to 16 first rounders in their brain. So, you know, it people are saying they could trade up. They're at the 24th pick. Obviously, they have four picks in the fifth round because those compensatory picks in the trade with Amari Cooper. Um, mm -hmm. Me personally, I think they're not trading up. I don't I don't I don't see a DDP. Um, I don't understand why they would do it unless maybe Jordan Davis. I wouldn't trade up for a Drake London. Just me. I like. I mean, Drake London's a good player from USC, six foot five receiver, um, you know, but he doesn't have the greatest speed. I just don't see why you would do that. You're going to have to give up a pick to do that. And usually when you're doing up uh, trading up, I mean, that's when there's a guy. And when you look at this through this draft, it's a lot of good depth, but there's not a lot of star power like years before. So I don't understand why they would try to do a trade up. Charles Cross was mentioned from Mississippi State offensive tackle. He's a good big kid could play guard, eventually could be the tackle. They were saying a Tyron Smith's replacement. But still, are you trading up? They're talking about going all the way up to 14th. I believe that's a smoke screen. I don't believe they're going from 24th to 14th because they got to give up a lot of capital to do that. And with Stephen Jones calling the shots, and as much as he cares about those draft picks, I have a hard time believing that they're going to trade up. Now, I've been doing my last mock drafts, DDP, and we've been trading down. And I've been trading down to gather picks maybe in the second or third round. Because that, would, to me, would be more optimal for the Cowboys because then you can get a couple sneaky guys maybe in that third, second, or third round when you gain that extra pick by moving down. Um, my last three my drafts, and even this one I just did, um, I moved down about at least three to four uh, spots uh, to gather a pick, and that could happen. So I think more, to me, trading down is more smart and feasible for the Cowboys because the draft is so deep. Um, and guard at, at the offensive line guard. Uh, it's deep with defensive end. Linebacker is deep. They got a lot of good receivers. So you don't have to jump up there and do that. Um, so we'll kind of see. But um, some guys that they've been really talking about, I uh, mentioned Drake London, um, Trey Lon Burks, a uh, receiver from Arkansas. To me, he's a boomer bust. He's a really good player. Uh, but he, to me, he could be boomer bust. Um, you know, with his uh, playing ability, Chris Olave is, to me, the most one of the most complete receivers in the draft. He's a little wiry, though. I love worried about his body, his frame. Um, but it seems like they really like him. That could be a pick. Sam Williams, defensive end from Ole Miss. He's been really talked about the last maybe month. Jelani Woods, tight end. These are players that I put in my mock draft, by the way. Um, Jelani Woods. And these are players that came on the 30-30 visits. OK, yeah. and that's key in the Cowboys world, because you come to the 30 visit, if they work you out and you come to 30 visit and you're available, they're going to draft you. OK, yeah, there's only been like one exception to that. You, and I can't remember who it was, but 
it was someone notable that it was like, oh, you could have had him. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, so let me ask this, as you talk about the strategy of draft uh, trading down, mm-hmm. do you think with how this offseason has gone between trading Amari Cooper, uh, cutting Lyle Collins, which I am fine with that one, honestly, um, but point being fans seeing this team getting notably worse, um, paying as much as they did for Schultz with the franchise tag and everything. Uh, just some of these moves that they've made and then this, all the scandals and everything that have happened. Do you think trading down would be like a almost negatively viewed by the fans, almost like a, an admission of defeat or something like something where it's just total loss of trust in that because fans don't want to see people. They don't want to see their team trade down. They want to see them get the best player available. And so if they're going to trade down, it might in the long term pan out and it might be the correct move. But is that something that factors in, you think, at all? I don't think so. Not this year, because I feel like this draft is not really big star power. And I think that's the reason why, because when I look at listen to a lot of people out there, um, a lot of people are saying it's okay to trade down. You know what I mean? Um, Because Mm -hmm. they want to gather picks. They want to get more picks to get more players. Um, and yeah. so it's not being unaggressive to me. If you, you trading down, you're being aggressive. If you're gathering picks so you can get more players. You get what I'm saying? Um, so yeah. I don't, I don't, in my opinion, I don't really see it's going to be viewed negatively just because like I said, there's not a lot of dogs. I mean, this quarterback class is one of the, I'm not going to say worst class, but it's not a good quarterback class at all. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? Right. So we always talking about quarterbacks dang near every year, right? But this ain't a quarterback mm-hmm. class you're talking about. There ain't really one guy even at the number one pick. It could be multiple guys at this number one pick. There's no – there's no, even from top five. This, like, this is an unknown draft because it's just yeah. really deep, no star power. So I think it would be uh, when I listen in the streets and even for myself, I don't feel defeated at all. I feel like, hey, let's get an extra second or third and then let's get aggressive in those rounds because those are your money rounds anyway. Let's keep it real. You mentioned uh, Traylon Burks earlier. Do you think his stock, you, you mentioned he's tremendous boom or bust uh, receiver out of Alabama. Do you think his stock seems abnormally high, perhaps based only on the hot commodity that Debo Samuel kind of presented himself as this year? His, his, it seemed like Debo, he's been a kind of known commodity for the last few years, but it seemed like a lot more attention went to him that where now it, you're hearing like, oh, trying to find the next Debo, trying to get the next Debo. And I feel like maybe with Traylon, that might be kind of fueling some of that where now people are saying like, oh, it could be a boom. Like, I feel like his stock elevated because of that, because the first thing I'm seeing mentioned is like, oh, well, I'm not going to say he is Debo, but like there's similarities there that like the fact that they're linking him in their mind tells me that like there's something of a recency bias to that. Um. I- with that Debo Samuel thing, man, I think they kind of just need to kind of uh, move away from that. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, you can use a Tony Pollard as a Debo Samuel for real, for real. If we're talking like that because you got a guy who played receiver when he was in college, you know what I mean? And he's, he's playing a, a running back. So you got that really right there with him, but you're still mm-hmm. not utilizing it. So um, I don't know. I just feel like, they just need to kind of um, kind of need to just concentrate on. I kind of just lost my train of thought for real, for real. <laughs> I was thinking yeah, of something. Cool. My, my, I repeated my you. I just had a brain freeze. I seriously did. They, they need to figure out how to scheme the weapons they have, like for the production they were getting from like Amari, for instance. It seemed like too often the mindset was like, all right, look, he's he'll be the number one option on the route, but we're not going to make a point of designing stuff to feed him the ball. Right. Whereas with Debo, he's so versatile, it feels like, no, you basically scheme your offense largely around him. And if you were to get uh, like Traylon Burks or something, there we you'd go. be kind of looking in a similar stance there. And that's why I think Dallas is kind of a curious fit if it's like, hey, we want to get our own Debo. It's like, I don't, so you yeah. are willing to adjust or modify your offensive scheme and system and I don't see it though. DDP you moved on from Amari yeah. because you weren't willing to do that, so he could produce for you at what you deem worth twenty million dollars a year. That's weird logic, right? I just feel like you know what? This is a copycat league 
don't have to copycat this. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't you don't have to copycat this just because he did that. You're talking about making him. Oh, let's have a Debo Samuels type. He don't even want to be Debo Samuels. Debo Samuels yeah. don't even want to be Debo Samuels. He's saying, I just want to be he a receiver. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just don't see that the Cowboys are drafting the trail on burst. And all of a sudden they're going to start putting him in all these magical spots and start doing all these kind of yeah. crazy things with him. I don't see it at all. Um, so I just feel like the main reason why Traylon Burks is the guy that the Cowboys have been talking about is because he has the Arkansas ties. Jerry and Steven went to our, uh, you know, graduated from Arkansas. They're heavily invested in that. He played there. Um, he's six foot two. He's 225 pounds. He's Dez like size. Um, he didn't have a great 40 time, but neither did Dez. But when you watch him play yeah, on the field, um, he plays fast. He plays really fast. Yeah. Um, so that intrigues you. Um, you got a guy in CD Lamb um, that is a little bit smaller than that, and you got a big body receiver that you can, um, you know, uh, get plays in the red zone. I don't know if he's a 50-50 ball guy, but he's big and strong. So I think that's the appeal. Um, but when we talk about other uh, receivers that I think they're like, kind of maybe a little better now. Uh, Chris Olave, like I said, he's more polished. If you're talking about the Amari Cooper type, he would be the closest one. Route running, hands, um, and, you know, his speed. About 4'3 speed. You know, yeah, 4 three nine speed. He has, he has the full repertoire, and I think he really could be really be good in that route tree. And then, like I said, yeah. Drake London, he's different from Burks because he is more the 50-50 ball guy. He's going to get up. He's going to muscle you. He plays like a basketball-type player, and the Cowboys could benefit that, especially with Dak. But I just feel like as a number two coming in, you got Gallup coming back. I don't know where Drake London kind of fits in there. So we kind of have to see what that. That's why I feel like Chris Olave would be more of the pick that would go with that offense. You understand what I'm saying? With a CD Lamb, it go he would go better with that offense that they currently have. That's why I think he would be the better fit. See that? I just wonder if Olave would slide that far. Um, and I know obviously we didn't fathom that CD Lamb would fall to what was it, 17, 19? I forget where the uh, 17? Exactly. 17, yeah. Uh, we didn't think CD would fall there, and yet he did. Like it happens every year, someone's going to slide that shouldn't slide. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Des got to twenty four. Dallas traded up to get Des at twenty four when that happened, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. But I don't know um, if he's there. It's intriguing, but I also think that to you know you addressed earlier, like they got to do something about this offensive line because. This thing for what has been invested in it over the years and how this was supposed to be the strength and identity of this team. That was really the first thing that just kind of failed them this year. Like they finally had the defense. They finally had the weapons, but because they couldn't control the trenches, it's like the system could never really get up and running as the season wore on and things just sputtered and sputtered and sputtered. Right. You know what I think that uh, I think is also, though, um, when you look at some of the top guys, Iguano, um, you know, uh, those few guys, when you look mm -hmm. after that, though, uh, everybody's saying we got to get this guard. We got to get this guard. You know, Kenyon Green, obviously, uh, when I did my mock, he was available with Chris Olave. But I just feel like when I look at the Cowboys, they like that star power type thing. And I feel like in their head, they're like, OK, Kenyon Green is there. He's a good guard but we don't want to miss out on somebody explosive for the offense. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I feel like they would pass that. And honestly, DDP, there's enough players in this draft. I just, you know, was saying, especially on the offensive line, we don't have to feel like you have to jump and get that guy. And then you're just feeling like, oh, we just out and this ain't going to work now because we didn't get Kenyon Green or Zion Johnson. Number one, I don't feel like they're going to draft a Zion Johnson anyway. Um, I don't kind of want him here. You know, I think he's more of a center. I watch him play center. I don't know if he – I'm not saying he's not nasty, but I don't know. I've seen it play. I don't know if he's nasty. And then Kenyon Green, um, you know, he has questions too. So I just feel like if there's an explosive receiver there at 24 and they're staying where they're at and Kenyon Green's there, I feel like they're going to go to receiver because they have other guys on the board and there's other people in this draft, especially at the guard position, then they can – they can pick up and he could still come in and play. You don't have to always have that. Oh, first rounder, he's coming in. No, there's plenty of guys that you can get in the third and fourth round that, that can, that, that can really come in and play. And I think this draft is deep enough in the guards that the Cowboys don't have to get that at 24. 
I can see the audacity of the Cowboys using the reasoning for why they have to take a wide receiver there being like, well, look, we already lost Amari Cooper. We already lost Coop. We got to get a wide receiver here if we're picking between a receiver and a lineman. And it's like, you you created that problem, though. Right. You didn't have to be in this conundrum. Exactly. You could have kept Cooper and then taken the lineman, and you would have been better off in the long run. Like, I, I get the idea of saying, like, hey, you can probably recoup through a good receiver in the draft. You can probably recoup the majority of the value in terms of the play uh, of a lot of these receivers. I get that. Receivers now that they're – making upwards of 2025, 20, whatever, you know, obviously Adams and then breaking the market completely really Christian Kirk is who broke that. If he's worth 18, good God, how many other guys are worth close to 20. Right. But uh, even still, it's like, yeah, but if you look at the production of what Cooper is and what his skill set and age and everything is, if a Christian Kirk is worth 18, you don't think Cooper is worth 20. It's just, I, I can't, I, I'm struggling still to kind of come to terms with that. Like that to me is like, you can't signal to me that that's a move where they're trying to get better and win a team that felt like talent wise, they were right there and that they should have made a deep run immediately gets rid of the number one receiver. And then even if they are going to draft a replacement in possibly even the first round, I just don't see how you're, how that's better, you know, for a team that's in win now mode and that's what they should be in. But that's, a whole separate thing. I'm not directing that at you. I'm no, that's the general. truth of what you're saying, though, because if you're talking about wearing whim now mode, you just had a 12 and five season and it failed. Why would you get rid of your top weapons? You lost weapons. You lost Randy Gregory. You try to spend this all well. Two is better than one. And, you know, availability was the issue, but you were signing him. You you had the signing down, and then it was changed. Amari Cooper, y'all just didn't like him. That's the problem. It wasn't about like. You just didn't like him. You didn't, didn't like how he was carrying himself with you guys, and that's what it is. There's no other reason, in my opinion, why Amari Cooper is gone except you didn't like him. Um, you didn't like that yeah. he was being uh, maybe rebellious in his own way with the uh, COVID uh, situation, with the vaccination. Um, he got fined for it. He was shown at multiple games without his mask. And I feel like the Cowboys was getting frustrated with that. And it was already talked, remember, before in 2019, how they said with the Philadelphia game, how they said he was taking himself out the game. So there was already rumblings in the building of frustration with Amari Cooper. And I feel like that's what – and they were already talking about the frustration with the Cooper this year. So that's why I feel like he wasn't coming back. They weren't going to deal with him anymore. And that's a sad situation because you let your personal feelings get in the situation in the way of trying to win a championship. And that's why I feel like to me, you let your personal feelings get in the, in the middle of this and you let him go. And now you're telling us, OK, C.D. Lamb, I like C.D. Lamb. But he's got to step up. He had a very good year last year. But he's he wasn't the number one guy. He's he's going to see a lot of different other things, and he's got to be able to be ready for that. And now you got Michael Gallup. You try to spin that to Cowboys fans out. Oh, Michael Gallup. He we signed him. He gonna be ready. No, he's not. We all knew he wasn't going to be ready. He probably wasn't going to be ready until the beginning of November. So you went from having a team that was ready to go and and kill it again next year. If he fell off, let's let's run it back. Now you're looking at you lost more than you gained, especially in free agency. Now you have to bank on the draft and hope that these players that you're drafting when you're worried about taking a big gamble of free agency, but you're taking the gamble in the draft of unknown players who've never played in the NFL. That's still a gamble, too. That's why I don't understand Stephen Jones thinking, but he's thinking in his head. It's the cheaper way. That's the only way it is, and that's the why he does it. It's the cheaper way through the draft, and that's why he can feel like he can gamble with that because it's a cheaper way. So for the draft, who is the player at the height, like the top of your like want list? Like if he's your everything stars align, who's the guy that you want for Dallas? Like whether it's even if it's not a specific player, like what position do you think is the greatest need? Um, ooh, greatest need. I, 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 I'm really not the greatest need. Ooh, that's tough because boss, me and boss Cowboys talking, he was talking about middle linebacker. And I keep on thinking like, man, I'm looking, listen to what you're saying. And linebacker, even though they have Jabril Cox, you know, have mm -hmm. Michael Parsons and they brought back mm -hmm. LVE. It is still a hole. 
that needs to be filled. Yes. They need a middle linebacker. Like boss was right. Like when he, when he first, he's like, no, nah, just listen to me. And then when he explained, I was like, yeah, they do. They, that if you look at all the positions along the field, okay. Yes. The guard position is open. Yeah. Yes. The receiver position is open. But when you look at the team right now, you would say the defense was ahead of the offense. OK, yeah. so we know that the defense is probably going to carry the offense in the beginning of the season anyway. Like the offense, we knew the offense was going to carry the defense beginning last year because the offense was already ready made. Right. And the offense came out hitting all cylinders. Right. And the defense slowly caught fire. And we saw what happened. Well, I feel like it's going to be the opposite this year. I feel like the defense is going to, have to come in like gangbusters and offense is slowly going to have to come together. So if that's the case, I like a Nicobe Dean. Um, you know, if a Jordan Davis was there, I still always want to go defense. The only one offensive player that I would go where I say, uh, go get this dude is the receiver from Alabama, uh, James, uh, Jameson Williams. Now that dude, he nice dog, like DDP, he nice. Um, I watched him. I don't know how he was a backup to Alave and Garrett Wilson. I don't know how he was a backup to them because dog, he is explosive. He's got the size. He is explosive, and I would take him, and I know he's recovering from ACL, and I don't like recovering, but he's one player that I would take even recovering from his ACL because I feel like he would really open up the offense for Dallas. Nice. So uh, we're going to move here into kind of our wrap-up segment here. Uh, this is – so I fielded some questions from the audience just on uh, the channel, and so we got three questions here. All of them are Mavericks, so I almost put them earlier, but I, I didn't want to wait too long right, to right. Get into the Cowboys thing. So uh, this is from at Dallas Mavs. He says, the Mavs can't give the, can't give the amount of money to Jalen Brunson that other teams have, so should they look to trade him? I would look for SGA from OKC, but I wouldn't like to see Brunson there unless there was a three-team deal or something. Here is my take on that real quick. Um, I think Brunson and Luca, uh, they're the two closest guys on the team. Like maybe Luca and Dodo might be about comparable to that, but it, this isn't the dynamic of Porzingis and Luca where they never really gelled off the court. Like these dudes are tight. And Brunson, like Luca is rooting for Brunson to get paid. If the front office dealt Brunson instead of paying him themselves, Luca would not be happy with that. It's also the first capable, like, sidekick essentially they've given him in his four years in dallas and i guarantee like he loves the fact that he came into the league with brunson that they were the same draft class and kind of went through that experience and everything together so i think dallas even though i'm worried about what the price brunson's going to demand is i just don't see a scenario where dallas ultimately moves him and i know a week ago i was probably saying i don't know i don't know but now the more I think about it, the more I think he's he's staying. He's here. Well, just to bounce off of you, I'm going to be honest with you. You had a, more knowledge to me on this because, you know, I, I wondered, um, you know, about that dynamic, um, you know, because sometimes I would look at how, you know, how is it going to work at times because Luka is ball dominant and now Jalen mm -hmm. Brunson's game is really stepping up and he's a dominant ball player as well. He When he gets that ball, he, he's cooking. So, you basically letting me know that that relationship is strong outside of this, outside of the basketball. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm feeling better because I was post on my Twitter like, man, you're gonna see uh uh he Jalen Brunson gonna be gone, dog. This is the last I'm gonna see him. I was saying on my Twitter, I was getting sad. Uh, but you know, listen to what you saying has got brought a little bit more joy in my heart. Um, especially with the off court. Um, if they if they're kicking it like that then I would definitely, you know, you know, um, Mark Cuban, he going to do anything to keep Luca happy. And if Luca's out there saying, Hey, keep this kid. I want him. I like him. I feel like, uh, everything Mark Cuban will do everything in his power to keep him here and make it work. 100%. And there's a reason why the same day that the Porzingis trade happened, Dorian Vinny Smith signed a new contract here. It's because it's the other guy on the team Luca is closest with and who he has been advocating for to get a new deal. It's no coincidence that as the franchise was going into kind of uncharted waters, they didn't know what was going to come after that Porzingis deal. They didn't know if it was going to be good, bad, or complicate things. And obviously it's worked out very, very well, but they, as a precaution, were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, 
we're keeping your favorite guy on the team, arguably, here long term and giving him the money that he's earned at this point. And, uh, you know, with Brunson, I think it's the same thing. I think he's in that same sort of territory. And I think they're going to take care of him, which good. They should. I don't see I don't see Dallas moving on from Brunson the more I look at it. And as far as uh, Shea Gildas Alexander, great player, but OKC and him are thick as thieves. I don't see them dealing him either, mm. but they'd be intrigued by the possibility of a somehow three team deal that had Brunson with him. Sure. But Josh Giddy is an intriguing prospect for them too. And another guy I like that Josh Giddy. creates a lot with the ball in his hand. So I just think that you kind of run into maybe a little bit of a log jam there, especially if you're paying Brunson big, big money. So I, I don't think the OKC thing in Dallas is a problem there. Uh, here's another question here. I'll move a little quicker. Uh, why is Luca playing? This is from uh, Bunk Top Bunk, BNK Top BNK. Yeah. Why is Luca playing so hard in the first two games back from an injury on defense and rebounding? Shouldn't Dallas try to minimize the physical strain and impact on him where they can? He's definitely playing. Hard. He's not holding back, which is good and bad. Like it's good if everything's fine and it just shows that like he's like, okay, it's the playoffs. I got to step up. The team did their job while I was out. Now I got to make sure we finish this. That could be part of it. And it could also just be that he feels largely good, good to go and is just playing. Like he's not thinking about it. He's just playing hard in general. And so you're seeing these things. But I don't know. I mean, the thing is they collect so much data on these guys now. Like they have them so censored up in practice. They can tell you how many pounds of pressure they're putting off of each foot, how they're leaning, how they're distributing their weight, how they're landing. Like you saw when Luca was out for those 12 days, you constantly saw him on the exercise bike. They were gauging that data against thousands of other data points throughout the season of Luca, seeing how he performed the same task at different times. It's obscene the amount of data they collect on these guys. It's not like 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's not just about feel. So if they're, I'm trusting, again, they have Casey Smith, one of the best medical staffs uh, in the league, uh, really professional sports to some extent. Uh, so it's like, you're basically trusting that they're doing everything humanly, med uh, humanly, medically, and technologically possible to make sure they're not jeopardizing their dude. Because yeah, we don't need a KD, uh, a KD finals situation. Yeah, I mean, um, me personally, the dude looks like he's just playing ball. And I don't when you're when you're out there, I've had injuries. Um, and when you're coming back from an injury and when you're just playing ball and you're not thinking of worrying about it, then it, you're okay. Um, so me, I'm not worried about it because when I looked at how he's playing, doesn't look like anything's really holding him back, doesn't look like the injury is holding him down or anything. So you don't want your player. Um, if he's not feeling any ill effects of the injury, you don't want him slowing down. You want him to go all out, and you don't want him thinking about the injury. When you go out there playing tentatively, worrying about the injury, that's when you re-injure it. That's when you get hurt. Um, so I like how he's just going all out, playing ball, not thinking about the injury. And like I said, usually when you don't think about those injuries, you just go out and play, those injuries don't come back. It's when you're trying to be super cautious and not trying to re-injure it, that's when that injury usually comes, and usually it's a worse injury that happens the second time. Yeah. Uh, last question here. This is from Rafa Sina. He says, how do you feel about drafting well this year and developing a talent instead of chasing stars in the offseason? We've seen how good in-house talents like Brunson can get if given proper time. I feel like if we get past the first round, the Mavs are going to try to rush to get a superstar and screw it up like they did with Porzingis. So the Porzingis thing is a different animal entirely. Um, I kind of get what you're trying to say, but like, at the time, they hadn't made the playoffs in a couple of years. They were rapidly heading towards a third straight year missing the playoffs. Second year with Luca was how that was working out. Well, no, it was for Luca's first year. Yeah, it was Luca's first year because Dirk was there. And people were hoping KP could somehow get back and play that year. But you were rapidly heading towards your third straight season without a playoff berth. And you had a chance to add to a young, potentially generational talent another guy that was deemed similarly and was through crazy circumstances available at that stage of his career. And that's tantalizing. When you look at what they gave up for him, I think that's just a move that like, you could say 
to me, it was high risk, low reward. The only thing that made it a significant impact was the contract you gave him after, instead of making him play the qualifying offer a year where you could have actually evaluated him, they kind of put a ring on it too quickly. And so I think that's a different situation than what we're describing here with the Mavericks winning a first round series. As for drafting a player, it, it's difficult to say because with the NBA, you only have two rounds anyway. And so everything's kind of a crapshoot. You don't find as many gems typically as you do like with an NFL draft where you can find great talent in the fourth, fifth, sixth round, whatever. And so I think that you're working with a, a lighter deck in that case. And you have to kind of bank on the best move possible that you can make in the moment. So if you're waiting three or four years for a prospect to maybe develop and become an all-star caliber player, Luca's not waiting three or four years. Like I know people want to say he's like Dirk, the next Dirk. I don't think you can bank on that. I don't think that's a smart or safe thing at all to do. And that being the case, I think you have to say, look, aside from maybe Brunson, anything we can do to get another star in here, we need to look at and do. As long as we don't upset the apple cart and flip it into an effing ditch, we need to do whatever makes this team as good as possible to contend pretty much now or next year. Um, I agree with 100% with that, uh, mainly because of Luca's attitude. I feel like it mm -hmm. is totally different from Dirk's. Luca's not going to sit there and be losing every single year. And he's not going to accept that, and he's not going to be happy with that, and he's going to voice his opinion about it. He's going to be very, very vocal about it. He's going to be frustrated and patient. So it's, it's always win now in the NBA, just like you said. It's not like the NFL where you have all those rounds. I mean, it used to be 14 rounds back in the day in the NFL. They cut that down. Why? Uh, because it's, it's you can't have all those players. In the NBA, they used to have all those rounds. Two rounds is hard, you know, when you get a player in two rounds. It, it's, it, that's, that's hard to get a player two rounds and have them coming in and playing ball. It's, it's, it, it's rare. You don't get those guys coming out and doing that. And I feel like you have to lean on free agency. And this is the reason why I say you lean on free agency now. Because these guys are coming out after their first year. They're not playing. They're not playing until they're 22, 23 in college anymore. These guys are young. So when you're getting these free agents, you're not getting them at 28, 29. You're getting them at 24, 23, 24, and 25. So you're getting them in good prime years. So And I feel like that's where you can um, go ahead and still scoop. And just like you said, it's win now. Um, it's not waiting for two, three years uh, to try to wait this player develop. If there's a star or there's an up and coming player and he's available and you're not killing yourself, as like you said, I'm um, in the in the end. Yeah, you need to go ahead and pull that trigger, because if it's going to make your team better and it's going to make your team better right now, I'm not sitting waiting through the draft um, and, and waiting to see if this player I drafted is going to develop into what I think he may be, whether or not I got a guy right now who is what I think he is and he can help my team right now. I'm going with that free agent and I'm a draft, but I'm going to get that free agent right now so we can go ahead and try to contend right now. Yeah, and this closing note here, just because I feel like this is my borderline mic drop on the on the question. Um, so he mentions Jalen Brunson, right? Jalen Brunson was a two-time national champion and a college player of the year with four years of experience. He was a nice prospect as a, as a rookie, decent as a sophomore. As his third season, he was pretty good. It was this year when he took off. You don't got four years to wait for a guy who already had four years of grooming, uh, three years, whatever, of grooming in college. Like, you, you can't say, hey, I don't want an all-star now to try and win now because I'd rather get a guy that's like a Brunson. Well, Brunson wasn't Brunson really then. So it, it's you're not finding wherever Dallas is going to be picking. You're not going to find the guy that is a generational immediate turn things around player. You're just not. So do what else you can, whether it's trades, whether it's free agency, that's what you do. I agree. But, but that concludes this first edition of Positively Relentless, the Dallas sports podcast. If no, you're just going to have to take my word for that. Uh, uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place, uh, depending on, I guess, where you're looking. If you're looking for the map stuff, that'll be here on Dallas Prospect. Cowboys segments will be over at Big Game James's YouTube channel. And uh, we're going to have this on a podcast mm -hmm. format as well. So that'll be available anywhere podcasts 
are available uh, for that for the entire run of it. I think I'll run the first episode in full on the channel as well, um, just so people can kind of see, get the preview of the podcast and all that side if they want to check it out. But we'll be back here same time next week, same time, same place, just ready to drop a little bit more knowledge on your head from the top world. Dig it. Anything, uh, anything else we're missing here? Anything else we need to call out for the lovely viewers? Uh, listeners? No, no, we just love you and make sure you get out here and support this man. We're going to do a lot more, um, you know, a lot more uh, in-depth things, a lot more content. Uh, so make sure you just get out there and support this, man. We're going to have a good time with this. Next time you hear about this, let next week we'll be talking about the Cowboys draft picks. We'll be breaking those down. Hopefully we'll be talking more Mavs basketball, what they'll be doing in the next round. So I'm thinking if the Dallas Mavericks can get to that next round, maybe it might be good for the Dallas Cowboys because the Dallas Mavericks haven't been in, out that first round in forever, right? It's been since they won the championship. That has been some years. It's been over 20 years for these Cowboys, and they've been failing. They haven't got out the first round. So maybe, DDP, I could be on the suspicion, uh, the, the, the weird tip, a superstitious tip, but let's let these Mavs get to this next round, and let's say, well, if the Mavs can do it, the Cowboys can do it, too, so we can have two glorious things happening this year. So come on, Mavs. Y'all start to get the ball rolling and get to this next round. Thank you. Peace.